Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Code Emporium where we're going to continue our dive through ChatGPT. In my last video, I actually described ChatGPT from just the high level standpoint of what it is and how it works, but I discovered that there were so many other components in each of these processes that I thought were super interesting and I wanted to dive through them because when I started learning about certain phases here, I thought that there was just so much more that we could get into that are not only useful in the context of ChatGPT, but like any kind of language model and also even general machine learning and deep learning too. And I'm hoping in the next set of three videos to illustrate each of these concepts, step one, step two, and step three in greater detail. And in this video, I'm gonna start with step two because it seems super interesting. So let's get to it. Now for this video, I'm first gonna still give a general overview of how ChatGPT works, just from a very high level as a pass one. And then on the second pass, I'm only going to go into details of step two. So let's get to it. ChatGPT is a language model that takes in some user prompt and gives out some response. So in step one over here, we basically have a pre-trained GPT model, which we then have labelers fine tune by generating both an input user prompt and an output response themselves as a labeler. And then we then fine tune the model using both of these in order to get a supervised fine tune model that can follow user instructions. And hence this is called SFT model. Now in step two, we take this supervised fine tune GPT model and we take in a user prompt to generate four different responses for that same prompt or this could be any number of responses, honestly. We then try to have a labeler determine a reward for each of these outcomes. And this reward is proportional to the quality of the response to the initial prompt. And then we can use this data in order to train a rewards model. So the rewards model is a function. So it has an input and output. The input is going to be a user prompt as well as one of the responses and the output is going to be some scalar value that determines how high quality is this response for this specific prompt. And so this is going to be a GPT model with essentially a scalar output. And we use the rankings that we generated from the past in order to train this rewards model. And in step three, we now use both of these models together where we take an unseen prompt and pass it into a clone of our supervised fine tuned model in order to generate some response. Now we assess the quality of response by passing it through the rewards model to generate the reward. And then we can use this number to further fine tune our fine tune model. And this is kind of how our fine tune model just becomes better at understanding human values, such as being non-toxic and factual. And so that's gonna do it for the first pass of this architecture. And in this video, like I mentioned, we're just gonna go through step two and answer some very interesting questions that I think are very generally applicable too. So first of all, when we have the supervised fine tuned model, we wanna generate at this stage, multiple responses for the same input prompt. So my big question here was, why can GPD generate different outputs for just one input? So let's say here that we have a GPT model, and in this case, it's taking an input, we'll just call this some U, and it's gonna be what's for breakfast. And the output of this model is going to be for every single timestamp, it will generate one word at a time. So it first generates today, then it generates we, then will, then have, then French. And now we are at this stage to generate the sixth word. Let's call this entire response W. Now, what GPT here is already trained and it already fine tuned as well. And so it already has a notion of language, just like a language model. And what that means is that it has an understanding of the probability distribution of word sequences. And so what it's going to predict here is, well, this is the sixth word, so we'll call that W5, given all the words that have come before it, that's zero to four, and this entire input context, so that's you. And so GPT is going to try to determine what this value is, and which word this corresponds to, and then it would output that corresponding word. Typically in machine learning models, if there is an output with the highest probability value, it will just output whatever that value is. 
But that's not exactly what we want in a language model, because had we done that in a language model for the same input, that means we would always generate the same exact output every single time. Because in this case, let's say toast is the highest probability word, we will always say today we will have French toast for this same input of what's for breakfast. But this isn't exactly human behavior and humans tend to say words that are not the most optimal at every single word that we speak. And so in order to circumvent this, we kind of use decoding strategies to make the decisions more stochastic and more human-like. So when we pass in the input context, what's for breakfast to a GPT model, now GPT will now go through a decoding strategy and this decoding strategy will then determine what word we generate. Now, there are many kinds of decoding strategies. There's, for example, there's nucleus sampling, temperature sampling, there's top K sampling, where the main goal here is not just to take the top word, but to sample from some top few distribution words here in order to generate this next word. And so it gives it some element of stochasticity. So let's take an example that today we will have French blank and GPT is supposed to determine what's supposed to go here. Now, GPT is already trained, like I mentioned before, so it has this knowledge of word sequences and probabilities. And so GPT determines that at this stage, this is the probability distribution of words that can go into this spot. So there's a 31% probability that this word should be toast. Then there's a 19% bread, 7% fries, and it's in descending order, this distribution. Now. With just a greedy sampling, which is the traditional case of like, oh, just pick the highest probable word, it's just going to predict the toast all the time and every single time. However, if we use something like top K sampling, let's say that K is 10, for every single word, like in this case, it's going to use the top 10 of these words with the highest probabilities in order to generate the word. So it takes the top 10 here, and then it will sample from these top 10 and then use that sampling as a part of this word next. And in this case, the top K is, well, let's just say we pick fries. So today we will have French fries would be the prediction if we had used the decoding strategy top 10. So with nucleus sampling, it's kind of very similar, but instead of for every single case, like every word, we always pick a fixed amount like 10, we'll pick a variable amount depending on the probability distributions that we have at that point. So for example, P is equal to 0 0.9 would mean that we will get the, all the words such that the top words that correspond to the up to 90% of the total probability. So if you add these numbers, you get 0 0.57. So hypothetically, if this P was 0 0.57, we would have only taken these top three, sampled from it, and then used that as a French word. And in this case, let's say that we could have gotten something like bread. Today, we will have French bread would have been the case with nucleus sampling. And then we have temperature sampling, where we kind of change the overall distribution itself and we skew it depending on a temperature value. So this temperature value, for example, can range from zero to one. If it's zero, all of the, the, the highest probabilities will be skewed much higher and the lower probabilities will be skewed much lower. And in this way, you will have like toast 10 to 100%, everything else 10 to 0%. And if you were to then perform this temperature sampling, it would be the same as the greedy approach because you'll always get toast anyways. However, as you increase this temperature to something like 0 0.7, this value of the probabilities will go decreasing for toast and it'll probably increase for the smaller probabilities so that when you start sampling, you get a higher chance of variability for this next word. And so you can see that as you get closer and closer to one, the randomness and variability of the word generated increases. In this case, let's just say it was toast. It could be toast, it could be something else, but the greedy will always have toast like I mentioned before. And so if we had done this in another world in the same way, we might've gotten something like this. This could have also been a very possible output where the top K nucleus and temperature samplings gave different possible words here, but the greedy will always give you toast. You can actually see all of this math in action by going to Playground for OpenAI. It's like a beta version. And you can just type in a specific prompt and you will get a response. And this response can be different depending on how you set the temperature. Or if you want to use like instead of temperature sampling, you want to use like some nucleus sampling over here. You can set up the top P value or anything else too. So I'd highly recommend just checking this out. And so I hope that how 
GPT can just take the same prompt and yet generate multiple responses makes more sense now. Now in this next phase here, we have labelers that need to rank different responses that we get here. And by ranking, they also have to assign some actual reward value because this reward is going to be used quantitatively in a loss function. So it has to be a number and not just like an arrangement that they've shown here. But how exactly do we correctly quantify the quality of a response here? So for every single labeler, they'll be given a screen that looks something like this, where they have, you know, they have the input prompt over here, they have the output of that prompt over here, and then they'll be asked to just rate this on a scale of one to seven. And then they're asked like a bunch of questions that are binary choiced over here. So one of my first thoughts in looking at this screen was like, why are we asking them so many extraneous questions? Don't we just care about the rating itself and this itself is just going to be used as the reward? Well, that is partially true actually. It can be used as a reward, but let's say that I'm a labeler and I choose three for a specific user prompt and an output. But how good is my rating of three? To get more meta into this, how high quality is my rating of three? You can't really determine that so well because what's three for me might be two for you or someone else. And because of that, it becomes harder to get very high quality ratings too. So to combat that issue, we use something called a scale. Now a scale is essentially just a set of questions with categorical responses that we ask. All of these questions are made to ascertain how well the labeler is sensitive to the issues that are being presented. After all, we want ChatGPT to have some understanding of nuance of language as well as understand sensitive topics. So there's a bunch of labelers and they all fill this out for the same question. We can then aggregate all of these responses for the specific uh, instruction output pair below. And then we can just say, oh, so it looks like this labeler labeled a three, but they didn't quite answer the questionnaire similar to how other people answered it. And so I'm not going to really consider their label three to be of high value. And hence, I'm only going to use the other responses that correspond to like the people who have labeled this in a very similar way. And so by filling out this questionnaire and only using responses that correspond to where the bulk of people had filled out this questionnaire, we can only get the ratings that are good ratings and are, can be used in order to train a rewards model. Also, just a little tidbit here, the typical type of scale that's used here is called a Likert scale. Likert scale is a common type of scale that typically corresponds to questions of psychological nature. And so, like I mentioned before, we have good labels here now. That's our first step to actually training a good rewards model. And so a follow-up question is here, how do we train this rewards model? Our rewards model is the same supervised fine-tuned model, but with a scalar output. And hence I've kind of connected all the neurons to just like a single output neuron here. The input is going to be a prompt and the corresponding response. And the output is going to be a reward that tells us how high quality this response prompt combination is. This architecture here is the duplicate of this rewards model architecture here. And so you can kind of treat this as like a Siamese network where we have a prompt response one here, prompt response two here, they have their own rewards. And we just compare this to the actual labels that we just generated, like which response was better. Now we generated rewards here. We can then use it in a loss function, which can then be used to back propagate some values and hence further tune this rewards model. Now this loss function here assumes that the response one is always better than the response two as a label. And it's also a very interesting function here that we'll try to get some more intuition on. So here's the loss function. And the R1 is the reward for the first response. R2 is the reward for the second response. And this loss function will assume that the true label was that the first response was definitely greater than the second response. Now, if our model, however, continued to predict that response one was greater and greater than response two, that's a good thing. And that good thing is reflected by our loss. It means that the model is actually getting it correct. And that's why we have lower and lower loss. On the other hand, if the model predict that the second response was greater than the first, this is wrong. And so you can see that as you increase the score by the model, if it was like much higher and higher, 
then you can see that the loss only increases here. And so this loss function is actually quite effective in training our rewards model. If you're kind of wondering like why we have a sigmoid function here, it's because that this loss is proportional to the log odds that the first response is greater than the second response. I've taken a screenshot of this exact loss function from the paper of Instruct GPT, and this kind of just shows exactly how the training is happening. You would think that like in normal training, we would just take all of these pairs, we have a loss value for every single pair, and we just randomly like start updating our network. But the problem is that like there are four responses, for example, from the same prompt. And if we take pairs of those, we have four C2 different prompts, which is like six different prompts in this case. And each of these prompts, if we keep passing them into the model directly and shuffling, it may lead to overfitting. And so what we would do instead is we'd start batching all of the, the single prompts with all of their response pairs together. And so all of the six kind of losses that we kind of get from the single prompt they are all used together to make only one update to the model instead of six updates to the model. And this has the benefit of one, decreasing the computation time because there's just less brought back propagation updates we need to make. And two, it also helps us prevent the model from overfitting, especially as the number of responses that we get for a single prompt is higher. K corresponds to that number of responses. I take it as four, but it could be as high as nine or 10 or anything that you decide. And so that's how we train our rewards model. And then we can use it, as I mentioned before, here to truly understand the quality of an unseen response, and then use this output reward to further fine tune our fine tuned model in order to have it generate more human responses that are factual and non-toxic. And so I hope that you all have a under, better understanding of how this step two truly works about how GPT generates multiple responses with a single input, how labelers actually rank, and also how to get rankings that are of high quality, and then creating and training a rewards model, along with some very cool loss function ideas. So that will be doing it for this video. I'm gonna make two subsequent videos, like I mentioned before, on step one and step three of this process so that we get a better holistic understanding of how GPT works as well as just understanding and learning new and cool ways of you know processes that are involved in machine learning and deep learning and the rest of artificial intelligence. So thank you all so much for watching. I hope you all enjoyed this video. Please do leave a like, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.